So hi, good morning, everybody. I'm sorry for the or I'm sorry for the technical problems. I don't really understand what's 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 going on, but we'll figure it out and hopefully correct it for the next time. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, uh, as as I've said all, all along, as I say before each one of these lunch and learns, and, and I know many of you have been to them in the past. Um, you know, if you have something that you want to present or you have something that you think might be interesting. Um, you know, please send me an email and uh, we'll talk about it and uh, we can you can uh, do a lunch and learn. It's a good way to reach out to people and it's a good way to get feedback on uh, your projects or your research or whatever you're doing. Um, today's presentation is using text analytics for optimizing critical decision making, a case study, getting the COVID-19 vaccine, a non-political discussion. John Aaron, PhD economics and PMP is a 26 year veteran project manage, of project management and data science consultant. Since 1995, uh, John has served a variety of organizations as a contract project manager and as a software solutions provider, specializing in enterprise project management, business transformation, project stakeholder decision making, project leadership, project management, machine learning and project data Management Data Analytics, SAP ERP Implementation Management, CRM, IT, Infrastructure, and Data Analytics. There's a lot of acronyms. Um, at, the, uh, at the end of the presentation, if you uh, wish to ask questions, we'll take them through the chat feature um, on, on the right-hand uh, part of your screen. We'll take as many as time allows, but John does not have a hard stop at one o'clock, so we can uh, go for as long as, uh, you know, as long as you have pertinent questions. Now I'll turn the presentation over to John. Okay, thanks, Tony. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll get right to the subject. Um, the, um, I'll just say briefly that my uh, introduction to text uh, is a rather uh, lengthy discussion. It goes all the way back probably to uh, cryptography at Bletchley Park uh, that was done that I used in some of my project management offerings. But I also, as a uh, professor of data science at Elmhurst University, where uh, I had brought uh, and had asked them to bring in WordStat and uh, uh, I taught this uh, to students. And it was a very, very useful tool I use for project management, but also for data science consulting for companies. So uh, decision-making has always been an important part, I, I would say, of my career as a consultant. And uh, uh, my degree, as Tony said, is in economics, but psychology has uh, been a uh, kind of a critical function of this in, as well. And it turns out that uh, text, uh, allows analytics, allows technology to kind of merge with this very in a very useful way for de personal decision making as well as uh, organizational. So what I'm going to do is uh, I am going to cover aspects of WordStat 9. Uh, that is the tool of choice for me and what I used in this. But also I want to lay out kind of the context and how all this kind of comes together for, for decision making. And uh, truly, I am going to be using the case study of taking COVID-19. Uh, however, I'm not taking a side one way or another on that, more, more so on the process of making decisions about this from a personal as well as an organizational standpoint. Uh, I'm giving my uh, email address here. So if anyone wishes to contact me, feel free to do so. So uh, basically, uh, as a starting point, I'm going with... Uh, a psychological framework from Herb Janus and Leon Mann that actually goes back to 1977. And uh, so many of you have probably heard the term group think, and that is the, a, a phrase coined by uh, uh, Herb Janus. And I've actually had, uh, uh, to some extent, I've had a, a good amount of work with Leon. Herb Janus died in the late 80s. I had an interview with him going back that far. And uh, I feel that they, they really laid a very important foundation and now the technology of text analytics has, has come along so far, I think the two work well together and I wanna to demonstrate how that, that works uh, from, from my, my perspective. So we'll start with a, uh, some definitions here and what Janice and Mann defined as critical decisions. So I'm not talking about trivial decisions, I'm talking about important decisions. And, um, as, as they quote, uh, there are those decisions that are expensive to change and those are not that are not, 
The expensive decisions shouldn't be made hastily nor without plenty of input from others. The others can be made fast and without input. And we're going to refer to um, these kind of expensive decisions as critical decisions using their, their terminology. And the important point to keep in mind is that the critical decisions are often accompanied by what they termed as decisional conflict. And uh, it becomes a, a kind of acute when the stakes are high and when uh, it's not clear cut which direction to take. There's risk involved no matter which way you take. Uh, and uh, there could be serious losses from these. And um, so what they went through is this, this process and they took a lot of case studies in, in 77 and later on, Herb Janus uh, put this for, for a decision making for policymakers. Uh, and um, you, you can see that with these uncertainties, the decision makers kind of hit with this uh, lose-lose appears proposition no matter which way they take. And uh, so you get these opposing tendencies to either accept or reject a given course of action that leads to symptoms of uh, hesitation, vacillation, feelings of uncertainty and uh, distress. And later on, uh, Herb Janus in his, his uh, book described that frequently for decision makers, uh, this comes with fear. And, and so it leads to a very, very uh, interesting uh, type of uh, analysis. And, you, and you, you ask yourself, well, can in fact we use um, the, the, you, you, the ubiquitous nature of test, text today, uh, as, a, as a, I'll speak as a data scientist, uh, you know, if I look at unstructured data versus structured data, there's a lot more unstructured and there's a lot of potential here to help us. And, and in terms of decision-making, it's been my, my view that uh, text can really help in this regard and, and kind of come up with a uh, using technology in a way to help us. So again, if we start out, and I'm gonna stay with psychology a little bit uh, and say that what Janice and Mann came uh, up with was initially was to say, what is the ideal criteria for making a good decision of this type? And they came up with these um, several of these criteria. And they said, first of all, what you do is you canvas all your al alternatives, uh, options that are available. You survey your objectives. What is it that you're really trying to accomplish? You look at your, your alternatives and you assess the plus and minus and risks of all those alternatives. And then you search intensively for information related to these alternatives. You challenge your initial choice, you re-examine all of this before your final choice, and you perform contingency planning, meaning that if you make a choice and it goes wrong, what are you going to do in advance, right? And they say, this is the criteria for good decision-making in a perfect kind of an environment. And um, one of the things that they studied was the limitations and constraints of human beings. And uh, to name a few, uh, and some of this, you know, none of this is really what I'll call new. The psychology of this I've studied pretty, pretty heavily, and it goes all the way back, you could argue, to 1850s in terms of what's been written. Um, and, uh, but to, to capture some of the things that they looked at, uh, the idea that human beings can only process seven plus or minus two bits of information that comes from a study by Miller. Decision makers have egocentric needs for prestige and self-esteem that they try to keep. Decision makers have affiliate, affiliative needs for acceptability, consensus, and social support. And certainly in an organizational context, that, that's very important. But then there's also uh, mental conflict and uh, sometimes called cognitive dissonance. And this occurs when beliefs or assumptions are contradicted by new information. Essentially, especially when people are invested already in a decision, when they're confronted with new information that kind of disagrees with what they think they wanted to do or where they publicly committed, they will tend to reject that information and, um, and kind of try to convince themselves that there really is no conflict. There's also decision traps, uh, which are kind of related to that, whereby uh, it, decisions are very hard to reverse when you've kind of publicly invested yourself in these. To say, saving face is very important. And also when decisions are associated with fear, decision makers can make a enter a delusional state. And Mirlu in 1949 is pretty famous 
for that, and, and Herb Janice mentioned that as well. Uh, and also, providers of information are not always completely truthful or may have bias. So the question becomes, can text analytics help, help us with this, right? And so if I look at this diagrammatically, one of the, the reasons why I selected Janice and Mann is that they talked about the role of information in guiding the purpose, the decision maker. And certainly we in text are in the information business, right? So if we look at the decision maker and we say that it really starts with information that gives challenging negative feedback uh, uh, to a course of action and uh, or an opportunity. And so the question it becomes is how do we use this information? And they came up with a very important scheme and that is the decision maker typically asks his or herself uh, four basic questions uh, about the risks that they see. And their idea is that information plays a very, very important role in terms of whether they answer yes or no to these questions. And typically, if they say no to these questions, they, they go through a short circuit type of thing where they make probably what they would call a non-vigilant decision. And at least temporarily, they go through a low stress condition until reality starts to set in and then it goes under high stress. And what they argued is that the role of information uh, can help guide people one way or another in this, this, this level. So good information, solid information kind of makes them say maybe or yes to these risks that they see. And ultimately they go through vigilance if, if they can get through this. If they don't, and the information leads them to another direction, they tend to have non-optimal types of decision-making. And so the goal then is to provide information in a format that the person can use and get through to a point of vigilance. And again, regardless, we're not interested in what the decision is as, as much as we are the process and how, how could text analytics conceivably do this and help us at, at the personal level as well as the organizational level depending on the context. And the key thing to keep in mind is that information can be used both one way to short circuit this process or another way to actually bring us towards what psychologists would say we have a choice, right? Uh, oftentimes you hear medical people say, look, there's kind of two sides of the human decision maker or the brain. One is we can go into our uh, cortex and be intellectual, or we can take a more primitive part of our brain and be animalistic and be instinctive. And with that tends to be kind of on the scale that, that we can say we can be intellectual versus animal. We can deal with reality or we can go into delusion. We can view things as an individual or we can view things as part of the herd, or we can be rational and scientific, or we can be psychotic and information uh, and words and phrases and this is particularly that came from uh, Mirlu as well as uh, Janice, these can be very, very important in terms of uh, guiding the decision maker. Uh, if we rely on adages or analogies and things of that nature, that's frequently used, for instance, by uh, advertisers or propagandists and things of that nature that kind of use these types of things. So we have information can go in one of two directions and be processed by the person to either be vigilant or not. And so if we go into detail uh, about those questions that Janice and Mann in 1977 uncovered, it really starts with this, that we can have this information that starts off and says, we have a challenge, we have to do something or not do something. And we, if we ask ourselves, are the risks serious if I don't change? And the answer comes up internally, no, then we go through what is called unconflicted adherence. It's at least initially a low stress condition. If we get information that kind of says, you might have losses if you just don't do anything, we ask ourselves maybe or yes. And it gets to the next question. It says, are the risks serious if I do change? And if we convince ourselves that there, we should just immediately change, it's a low stress con condition called unconflicted change. But if we have counter information that says, well, there may be losses if you just change, automatically, then we ask maybe or yes, and then we go into a little bit higher stress condition. And we say, is, there, is it realistic to hope to find a better solution? 
And if they say no, they just kind of do immediately, but it leads to high, high stress. And people tend to become defensive. They try to bolster the reasons for their rationale of what they've done and so on. But if the information says there's signs of more information available, then we ask ourselves, well, maybe or yes. So we go to the next thing, is there sufficient time to search and deliberate? We say, no, it's high stress. They go into what's panic or hypervigilance. And, uh, but if we have counterbalancing information, it leads us to maybe or yes, which Janice and Mann called vigilance, which ends up with a thorough search and appraisal, which gets us close to that ideal decision-making that is most likely to give us the best possible consequences. Whereas the other ones are less likely to give us the consequences and we may very well end up having regret. And so they did a lot of benchmarking and they looked at people in fires and various conditions and organizational and so on. And they came up with this framework. So for them, the goal they say is vigilant decision-making. And the idea here is that information plays a very, very important role in guiding people through this. So if we kind of shift gears a little bit and we look at different dimensions of this, we say that, well, it can be very, very multidisciplinary how we view this subject. One is that we start at the bottom here with challenges and opportunities from the environment. We have different information sources, such as websites, you know, and internet search engines, different people we talk to, social media, research, television, and so on. So the idea here is to canvas following this a wide range of alternate sources of information. We don't want to just lock ourselves into one. Likewise, uh, I'm going to be talking about the statistical concepts of wisdom of the crowd, the idea that if in fact we have uh, many different sources of information and we have varying different viewpoints and we construct uh, uh, our information in a way that is digestible and that's very, very important, that then can kind of guide us in the psychological, uh, uh, you could say this polarized psychological sense of which way we go and stay vigilant. And so we gather that information and we, we uh, use it in a rational way, leading to what economists might call rational, kind of John von Neumann uh, optimality of, of risk management in terms of making a choice that matches our utility function, if, if you want to think like an economist and so on. So it tends to be a rather multidisciplinary type of thing. And obviously, the, the idea of using statistics and, and uh, tech, technical tech, text analytics becomes a very, very uh, operational uh, type of input uh, to, to, to help drive this. So a couple of things, uh, I just pulled this slide from the internet, but it is, it is frequently used. The idea that when you get information, it's very important that it is not just raw information. There needs to be context, there needs to be meaning, there needs to be insight to give us kind of wisdom to, to make this, get this understanding. So data, raw data itself is not as helpful in terms of resolving risk as when it, it is kind of aggregated. And one of the things that I'm going to show is that the use of WordStat 9 is a very, very powerful tool for getting the information at the right level in terms of text and efficient extraction of that to get kind of this wisdom of the crowd at the right level. And the tool, some of the two tools that I really like about WordStat 9 is the multidimensional scaling and mapping in it, and also the keywords and context uh, becomes very, very powerful in terms of uh, getting the information at this, this, this right level. And I'll demonstrate that. Now, the other thing, for those of you that are really into uh, Leighton Dirichlet, uh, uh, LDA, um, I, I, you know, I, I'm a data scientist, I use different tools. Uh, I find that WordStat 9 is much more effective than using LDA, even though LDA, probably the algorithm is a lot of, lot of um, notoriety right now, a lot of popularity and so on. Uh, so I tend to stay with some of the, the more traditional uh, uh, types of statistical methods, but also a lot what's in WordStat right now is, is a very, very um, effective, I'll say. The other, the other aspect of this is this, uh, because I'm a statistician, right, is this uh, the idea of uh, wisdom of the crowd. And, and this is a text I used in teaching graduate uh, uh, data science, one of the courses I taught, 
this idea that what happens is the idea of being correct. Now, this is a kind of a simulation of uh, Academy Awards uh, that's in, in the text by some of these world-class uh, data scientists. And it shows that when you have multiple viewpoints, uh, even if people have less than perfect information and they're not totally uh, informed, the idea of having multiple viewpoints gives greater ac accuracy and less variance than just single individuals, uh, even if they're highly informed. That's a very, very interesting concept, right? The idea of having multiple viewpoints and uh, uh, getting that because there's some statistical properties that are very interesting. And I found this very, very useful because uh, when dealing with certain things, not everybody has full knowledge, right? That's providing input to you. And not always is everybody totally honest. Uh, they may have agendas or they may have points, uh, advertisers and you know, propaganda and so on like that that's been going on. Uh, and this really, this has been a very formalized subject since World War I, really. So that becomes an element. And so crowds imply large enough samples and a balance of perspective. And the ubiquitous nature of text makes it kind of an ideal source. So with that background, what I want to do now is just kind of move into a practical case study uh, of this. And for me, again, that it's a very, very uh, political topic right now. Uh, and for me, the decision is irrelevant of whether you've taken the vaccine or not, or if you were going to take boosters or whatever. I'm not worried about that or even going to deal into personal preferences as much as the process of achieving vigilance based on Herb Janice and Leon Mann's uh, uh, foundation. And um, the sources that I use were internet search, social media, and transcribing relevant videos uh, to get everything into text that I could. So if we, if we take a look at this, what I did, and I did some of this as a teacher uh, over the summer. And so my, my search for data started in May and ended like in October. Uh, I took uh, about 409 documents uh, and imported those into WordStat 9. And I did my best to get a wide variety of on doing internet searches, but most of those were very, very pro taking the vaccine. And so what I tried to do following their method was to get and balance this with, with uh, social media accounts that many I got from Telegram, uh, also some videos and things that I transcribed using sonics and got it into text. So I did my best then to one, have a crowd, at least 400 documents, and two, try to get some balance as far as where people were, were coming from. And, and one of the things I'll, I'll note is that I've also done this exercise using thousands of technical articles on the subject. And what I found was that it, uh, there were so many articles, so diverse, it's, 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 uh, it's, I found it to be more effective for decision-making to go, for instance, on the positive side, go to see like people that comment from the CDC, Center for Disease Control on one side, or doctors that are kind of on the other. So it's already been kind of digested and summarized as opposed to going to thousands of technical journals. And that's, that's the decision that I made, even though I've tried it, it both ways. So the wisdom of the crowd exists within these documents, we'll say. The challenge is to get efficient extraction and rapid understanding for decision making. And kind of doing an aside is that because I'm a scientist, I would say, right, try to be, um, the, the idea of balance is very important from a scientific standpoint. If you consider, uh, you know, it depends on your own view of science, but Karl Popper, logic of scientific discovery has been uh, one of those scientific theories or, or philosophies that I have stuck with in my career. And, you know, if you listen to Popper, nothing can be proven true, but theories can be refuted and proven false. Like all swans are white, disproving by one black swan. And what Popper said in logic of scientific discovery um, in the 30s, a, a theory which is not refutable by any conceivable event is non-scientific. Irrefutability is a virtue of, uh, uh, is not a virtue, it's a vice. And every genuine test of a theory is an attempt to falsify it. And hence, science requires all sides, pros and cons of the issues to be examined and debated. 
So kind of what the wisdom of the crowd and Janus and Mann were saying is very, very corresponding with this, right? And what also Popper came up with was this notion of verisimilitude, where he said there's partial truth that may be uncovered by rigorous debate. So meaning that people and sources may be at least partly true. It's not a black and white type of thing. And um, so what I did was I tried to uh, weigh things as either being pro and con by using a sentiment index that I also added uh, to this. The other part of science, and I, I'm not gonna make this a lecture on science, is, but it, it is useful, is that if we look at um, Charles Peirce, who lived and wrote like the early 1900s, he came up with three types of reasoning. He called one abductive reasoning, which is given from the data that it may be true. And basically that's the, the basis of hypotheses. Uh, and he said like an example of abductive reasoning is that like all beans from this bag are white, these beans are white, these beans are from this bag, right? So it's a hypothesis uh, based on some data and it allows us to get started with generating hypotheses. So the hy based on abductive reasoning, the hypotheses that I created given this was H my, my basic hypothesis, taking the vaccine is good, the alternative hypothesis is taking the vaccine is bad, right? So I came up with those two based on some preliminary data. But then if we go into deduction, right, where, where Peirce called it deduction, which begins with a hypothesis being assumed true, it proves something must be. And as it's based upon identifying the logical consequences of this, it's a, it becomes kind of a second step. So as an example, Premise, all the beans from this bag are white. Premise two, these beans are from this bag. Conclusion, these beans are white. And so where this becomes useful, right, and, and with text is you look for consistency. Uh, when people, are they consistent? And from a, you could also argue that the text metric coherence tends to fall into this category as well. And so what this made me do really is as I started looking, especially using keyword in context, I discovered certain sources, not in the 409, because I actually looked more than 409. I looked at maybe thousands. And I started eliminating like political pundits because they were not consistent in what they were saying all the time, right? And I, so what I did is, especially for those that were against the vaccine, I really limited the documents and, and uh, to qualified doctors, virologists, and medical researchers. So I got rid because of inconsistency or incoherence, shall I say, uh, I eliminated them. And that was my decision to do that. And I did it, but I did this for scientific reasons. Now, the final third element here that we look at is induction, according to Peirce. And this is where data scientists and text analytics really kind of, the tools become extremely operational. So induction consists of starting from a theory, deducing the predictions as said before, and then really doing pre predictions from the, the, the theory itself. And this is where the probability starts to come in. And this is where weight of evidence becomes extremely important. So the more, so when we look at text analytical tools, the more frequently something is mentioned, the more likely there's a probability to it, right? So that, that it's a very, very foundational. It goes all the way back to Frank Ramsey statistically in the 1920s and I.J. Good and Alan Turing and uh, a lot of people you know, started dealing with induction. And uh, this, this is kind of the foundation of probability. And so what happens is that this example, as Peirce mentioned, these beans are from this bag, these beans are white, all beans from this bag are white. Well, what happens is the more bags you sample, right? The, the greater the weight of evidence, the more the greater the probability. So what happens then is if we start operationalizing some of these scientific contexts with text, induction is analogous to connecting the dots. A cumulative weight of evidence is built upon frequency of mentions, correlation, and prediction. And this is where text analytics in terms of counts of things becomes very, very powerful in aiding decision-making. So enough, Enough of the science and the background, let's kind of get into some of the use of some of the tools themselves. 
So when we take this sample that I came up with 409 and I use the topic model, right? So topic modeling is uh, one aspect of WordStat 9 that, that was used here that was kind of critical to get started. So I'm taking, you know, things like adverse reactions came out as a, as a critical topic. And uh, we start looking at counts of things, right? You can kind of see there. Now, what's in WordStat 9 that's a, a very, very powerful are these suggested phrases, not just the pure topics that are kind of extracted at one layer, but the ability to come up with these suggestions underneath really is very, very revealing in this particular study. And uh, so basically bringing these topics in and the suggested phrases that come with these here into the dictionary uh, and being able to classify these, right? In some cases, I've used some of my own language based on, on, on the topics I've added those. And then I consolidated these a little bit because so many different adverse consequences were coming out, I kind of grouped them uh, into one, one major category. So I did a little bit of my own consolidation here. But you see that what comes up is some uh, very specific types of things leading tied to the both the pros and the cons of taking the vaccine. And again, vaccine, th this is just one example. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to speak more generally to whatever subject you're dealing with, right? So this is not I'm using this just as a, as a explanatory topic, but the methodology that I'm using is I'm saying that that's the key point I'm trying to bring here is that you build a dictionary based on the topic that's extracted as well as the key phrases that come out to that that are recommended uh, by, by the tool. I'm dismissed, I, I turned my, uh, just one second. <laughs> I put an alarm on this to, to signal it. Uh, 45 minutes, but we got started late. So uh, it's not relevant. Uh, so anyway, this is key. This is key, right? So if we look at this and we recognize that we use the, the multidimensional uh, uh, scaling, the map that comes out of this, where we have this, the vaccine is good kind of on one side, the vaccine is bad on the other. And we draw this artificial line for dimensionality to say we kind of have uh, bad on one side, good on the other side. Right, we have a balance here. What you see uh, are those critical factors for consideration for decision making, and you'll see for yourself that I that I have an index of negative sentiment, an index of positive sentiment that was done that I use in general for any analysis, because good and bad is 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 an extremely important uh, construct in marketing and so on like that. How people believe about things. And what you see is that the negative sentiment and positive sentiment here, uh, in some cases, I had some that were a little bit contradictory, right? Where certain things uh, uh, didn't really match, where I had uh, uh, people talking about having like graphene oxide in, in, in the uh, shot, but it was yet more towards the positive. And that's because in, it, this is really tied to the number of positive words, right? And how those match. But basically, the demarcation line itself worked out reasonably well in saying these are the considerations uh, recommending get the vaccine, the idea that it's proven safe and effective, the idea that the clinical trials mentioned that it's safe and effective, uh, the idea that some people were saying they're glad and thankful they got it. And there was a large group of mentions of people that said, people that say otherwise are really conspiracy theories, right? There's a whole lot of that. Now, there's other miscellaneous items here you can look for yourself. And you know some of these are real gems, right, on both sides that you can consider, but I'm just going after the, 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 the general gist. Now, those that are against, uh, basically the dangerous side effects and uh, the idea that there's also uh, other alternatives, that it was not proven safe and effective, that it's experimental, that there's a spike protein and that uh, there's doctors, some doctors that don't recommend it, right? And so what happens then is that this gives the decision maker looking at both sides of this, this hopefully uh, pushes them up through the point of rational decision-making. It's based on their own preferences, their own understanding of risk versus reward, right? And so this is the, the idea 
of using a, a method like this. And so uh, the idea here that Mirlu said, the masses are rather easy to hypnotize because of the action of suggested words. And so when you look at the relationships, right, between these key phrases and so on, it helps the person get through that either way, right? Because advertisers are well known uh, for coming up with key phrases and catchphrases and, and jingles and things like that to, to kind of steer people in decision-making. When you put it this way, it allows a more objective view of pros and cons as Janice and Mann had, had recommended. So if I look at this and I say, uh, let's go back to Janice and Mann and we say, okay, if we look at one side of the story, what has come out? Uh, uh, you know, you, you get this kind of notion, if you do nothing, well, it could kill you. Uh, basically, uh, it's saying uh, that takes you to the next phase, the vaccine is safe and effective. Uh, essentially, the risks are not serious. If I change and do that, serious side effects are rare, right? Uh, don't listen to misinformation, uh, other information over here, listen to the CDC, information contrary is conspiracy theory. Take the vaccine now or lose your job about time pressures, right? That's going on. Uh, Non-compliance leads to immediate job loss, right? So that's kind of high stress. And they may say, well, I'm going to, you know, I got to do, do that. But if you're able to get through all of those, then you get into uh, um, um, the vigilance. Now, if you listen to both sides, what's being said, the decision maker is saying your chances of dying from COVID-19 are less than 1% unless you're in a high risk category. Uh, do nothing, ignore all methods, messages. Well, you don't want to do that. Nobody's saying that. Um, the chances of dying, serious injury are greater from the vaccine than from COVID. That side is saying low risk, take the vaccine. It's a mandate. So that's kind of the counter to it, right? Uh, so you have to weigh that. So you get through this maybe or yes, you got pros and cons. And what that's doing, it's increasing the stress level of the decision maker. More information, well, like, Peter McCullough says early home treatments are very successful. On the other hand, CDC says they're not acceptable, right? Like hydroxychloroquine and so on like that. And, you know, one side is saying, wait, don't be coerced. The other side is you better take it right away. And so as the decision maker goes through here and is saying maybe or yes, right? Which is all in the analytics that takes you to vigilance and regardless of the decision the person makes, if you consider all these options and you go through this, whatever choice you make is considered vigilance, right? And people can do it. And so you consider all the options, you do that, and then you, you follow that. So what I, hopefully I've kind of demonstrated is the fact that, okay, doesn't matter the choice, I don't care, uh, as much as Somehow I got muted. All right. Mm. Uh, the the um, can everybody hear me, Tony? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, and I am going to start wrapping up. Right. The idea here is that the um, in addition to WordStat 9's analytics, you can also export this. Uh, it's a it's an, a very powerful feature where you can export this to other tools, and uh, you know it has machine learning in it and so on. And and sometimes what I do is I, I will use uh, other, other machine learning tools depending on the nature of the data. Uh, and, um, you know, so for instance, I, I ran this into and exported this into Minitab's SPM um, machine learning tool. And so in, in doing this, it kind of gave me the, the weights, so to speak, of which variables are most important in that decision in terms of uh, looking at the, the um, um, oh, gotcha. the, the overall uh, mm. weights, weights that I'm looking for, for, for the um, classification, this is classification, where I'm looking at the, the people that have sentiment that's positive versus sentiment that's negative. And what's driving that sentiment are like the experimental and potentially fatal, but also the testimonials, glad and thankful. So one was positive, one was negative. Clinical trials, safe and effective, that was very important to Swader. Uh, getting the vaccine, the recommendation to do this, but also the danger, 
So you can see for yourself, you, you see which scenes kind of seems to be most important in terms of giving classification based on sentiment. And uh, so this shows you the classification accuracy here, uh, which was pretty good, right? And uh, uh, about 80%, which, so I had a pretty good uh, prediction model uh, for overall attitude about sentiment, whether positive or negative. So basically, this is predicting the people that have a positive attitude about the vaccine versus those that don't. And these are the factors that contribute to that uh, in a fairly, hopefully, objective way. And for organizational decision making, right, um, what, what these weights are, are, are quite helpful. So this is an example of a decision making a uh, uh, tool that organizations might use where you basically, you look at your criteria for making a decision, must criteria, what must it do, what's, what's, what do you want, and you look at weights and you just do kind of a, a, a pew diagram or whatever you're doing, a weighted score. So this becomes very, very useful for um, organizational decision-making. And of course, there'd be other criteria such as uh, if we're a federal contractor, we're gonna lose all of our business because we're not, in this program, but so all of these things enter into it. Uh, but some of the ones that I mentioned that are for personal decision making are very, very useful. And the weights, right? What seems to be most important? So you can you you can kind of bring that in. You can derive those empirically using using that. So uh, uh, Tony, I don't know <laughs> because we started a little late. I'm not sure how I'm doing the schedule. You're doing uh, you're doing you're doing great. Let's uh... okay. So, so this is this is kind of where we're at. <laughs> I, I, I went through what I wanted to talk about, and I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions and comments. And uh, uh, glad to answer things. Also, if anybody wanted to contact me individually, I'm very happy to uh, respond individually uh, as well. So, how about if we open it up for uh, for discussion? Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you very much, John. And again, everybody, I apologize for the technical snafu. Uh, we did manage to get a number of people through direct email contact, and uh, we'll try to figure out what went wrong and make sure this doesn't happen again. If you want to ask a question, please use the chat feature uh, on your on on the right hand side of your screen, um, and we'll uh, start. Uh, we'll take as many questions as we can. Um, John, a question about um, how did you assess LDA versus WordStat, or what was the, what did you see as the problems with uh, with LDA? Yeah, um, using LDA, and I use two different packages uh, historically, actually with this data set. Uh, and I'm not going to mention the vendor, okay? I, I respect every vendor that brings a product to market, and I never want to badmouth anyone. But here's, here's the, uh, the story with LDA, in that essentially uh, in doing this, uh, it comes up with topics that are tied to just strictly words, connections of words uh, that are frequency of mention. So for instance, you end up essentially with something like multiple word clouds, a word cloud for every topic. So you end up with then are, are words that are, are the largest words, right? Have the biggest letters uh, next to words that have the second biggest letters next to words that have the third biggest letters and so on. And so what you end up with is a, um, what I'll call a lot of false topics that are not terribly relevant, but also the level of layers within the topics, getting into like the key phrases that are within certain topics was very, very difficult uh, with that. Now, it did give uh, at a, at some, some topics, they, they came out, but the level of detail, I mean, if you looked at the dictionary, if you recall the slides that I just built, the level of detail and the, the, the clarity of the sub, shall I call subtopics, uh, I could not get using LDA. And I know, you know, David Bly's algorithm, I, I have followed his stuff. Uh, I went through all of his videos and I tried these tools and so on. And, uh, you know, it's like anything else, there, there's some, some good points to it, but it's really so heavily tied to just frequency of mention of certain individual words without really this, this the, the, the secondary analysis of the relationship between clusters of words that I found that the topics were not as actionable as what is happening in WordStat 9. And was, and, and did, 
Yeah, you mentioned the importance of phrase extraction. Was that also part of it too? In the fact that with the phrase extraction, you couldn't do it as well through LDA, or was that? Well, same? well, they're really, yeah, that is that is true. Right, right. To get it tied to those topics, the relationship of topic to phrase is not clear uh, in those. Uh, you know, just by doing counts, you can get phrases uh, in almost any any tool, but it's that relationship of topic to the phrase related to the topic. And the suggestion that is tied to that topic, it just, maybe you can get it, Tony, but it just takes a long time. And uh, I don't think I would ever have been able to build a dictionary like I did uh, using LDA. So I, I, I really um, don't use LDA uh, very often, uh, although I have tools that do it. Does that answer the question? I think so. Yep, yeah, it does for me. I, but now, and you just uh, segued into the next question. Um, did you build the dictionary from scratch, or did or did you use a uh, an existing sentiment dictionary and modify it? How how did you go about that process? Well, I have over the years built my own sentiment dictionaries, and uh, what I did with those is I started with marketing types of things. I I, I like, for instance, I had uh, I started more with product building goods and bads based on product. And uh, for instance, I, I got some uh, uh, data sets available online about, uh, for instance, uh, uh, products from Amazon and things of that nature. And I looked at, uh, I've separated good uh, words tied to good, tied to bad, to products. And, and then I, I, I continually refined that over the years. And I did this mainly because I was a professor, right, for about five years. And uh, uh, then one, one holiday season, I actually uh, went through uh, a, a complete dictionary over a holiday period and I picked out negative words, tried to be negative words. I actually almost, I think I almost burned my eye sockets out uh, doing that. So I've been really heavily into sentiment, but I did in fact use, build my own dictionary on this. Now, uh, in this particular exercise, I did augment it to make sure that I had enough words, both positive and negative, uh, tied to health. Uh, uh, and so I did augment that slightly, but that's something that I built from scratch over the years uh, uh, from a marketing standpoint. And is it something... Uh, is is it something that you continually to improve or change, or do you find it that works across different uh, themes? Uh, I have found it to use work well across themes. Uh, for instance, uh, I worked with one organization on um, uh, doing this on their projects. Uh, I've also had um, I don't want to get too specific about client work, but uh, I have used it across several different types of consulting engagements and academic type of things. Like I took the data set on complaints from Comcast and so on like that. I, I did augment that. And it, uh, uh, it, it did work out very, very strongly from a prediction standpoint um, in that regard. So I believe it is relatively robust across different applications. I don't want to say, say it's the best. I don't want to say it's the best because I have no idea what the best would be. Well, I think that the best is probably depends on the subject matter that you're 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 probably. dealing with. Probably. Um, um, okay. A question: um, what, how, how did you use? Did you use keyword in context a lot in in developing yes. your dictionary? And yes. did you did you find it useful? And can you talk a little bit about why you found it useful? Well, yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, if you recall, when uh, I talked about Charles Peirce and his concept of science and, and deduction was extremely important. And so one of the things the keyword in context does, uh, you can use it at different levels. Like you can use it at the topic level, you can use it at the phrase level and so on. I used it to see and try to measure consistency. Uh, and that's what, it was really a keyword in context that helped me uh, decide to eliminate certain um, documents uh, because people were not terribly consistent. Uh, so for instance, um, if I saw that, uh, and I told Norman this on a discussion, one uh, source was mentioning, they started bringing politics into this. And uh, the person, you know, the person on, on one, one document says, uh, Hillary Clinton is dead. 
the next topic says Hillary Clinton is going to be vice president. Okay. Well, when you see, you know, those are two mutually exclusive sets. And, and so, you know, that's an extreme case. But what I try to do is look at to see if there are contradictions being made. I mean, that helps in terms of separating documents and so on. Uh, so by having the keyword in context, what that does, it allows you to take the topic, the phrase or whatever, and you see the key phrases that are tied to that or words tied to that, and you can spot contradictions. And that's, uh, uh, well, besides just getting clarity. I mean, there's a certain, to a certain extent, you, you know, the idea that you do text analytics, and that means you don't have to read anything. You know, it just answers it for you. I don't really believe that that's totally true. I believe it is important to actually do some of the reading of what it is you're analyzing. And so the tech, the keyword in context makes it very, very easy to see for a particular context what is actually being written and to spot contradictions and incoherence, consistency, right, uh, across those things. Okay. And could you, and it, it in the you know you use the you you seem to rely a lot on the month on the multi-dimensional scaling uh, yeah. graphics yeah. um was could you talk a little bit about uh, about that i mean uh, how sure. sort of key was that to you well i think it is probably for this analysis the single most important tool that i use and the reason is this i i um uh, do a lot with partly because of my marketing background in a way, uh, I do a lot with um, decisions you, you, you could say that are uh, tied to factor analysis and principal components analysis. And so I, I use a lot of uh, factor loading uh, charts and things of that nature. And what happens is that when you're looking, think in terms of principal components, where what you're looking for is a graphical visual display of dimensions, statistically, statistical dimensions, those things that are tied together in groups, because what you're trying to do is, is tie constructs, mental constructs uh, together. Well, what happens is if you use just a regular principal components uh, factor loading scale, what happens, it shows positive sentiment and negative sentiment as being very highly correlated. Okay. And what's causing that, of course, is that the number of words being mentioned, right? So when you have, uh, and what you may see as a practitioner is often very, very uh, uh, almost contradictory kind of things where it's showing that the, the um, certain factors are correlated, even though they are either orthogonal or they're absolutely opposite each other, right? And so what happens is, uh, the 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 way the similarity measures, uh, you know, however Provalis has whatever adaptation it's made for multidimensional scaling, it it has allowed the the um, distinction. Uh, so holding holding all those those things apart, it, it allowed the actual polarization of of the constructs in a visual way much much more clear than a typical display of either factor analysis or principal components. And so when you when you know when you're able to look in a space and, and I can uh, just quickly go back to that, right? If we wanted to uh, this slide right here, right? The idea of, of, of showing these in such a clear, uh, obviously the dimensions, the dimensionality, right? Uh, is dealing with the sentiment here, the way it's so far separated, right? That it is just such a clear cut distinction. Yet what it is showing here are the associated correlated factors, right? Uh, that are tied to these things that, that are kind of driving it. And yet it's showing some of these other things that may very well be very important visually, but, but the actual, these are more outliers, so to speak, and they're more prone to be individual documents as opposed to what might be referred to as the wisdom of the crowd, okay? And so I view this as the single most important analytical tool for this kind of an exercise that's available. Okay, well, thank you, thank you very much, John. Are there any other questions? Um, I'm just sort of, I'm looking here, I don't really see any more. Um, again, uh, John, can you put the last slide back up, please? 
Sure. There we go. Thank you very much. So John's email is on the bottom there. So if you want to get, he's happy to, uh, to for you to get in contact with him if you want to, if you have things to share or uh, uh, others. Um, sorry. Uh, the, the um, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm so, I apologize. I just got distracted by somebody who sent me a, a, a text. Um, so if you want to get in contact with him, please, uh, please, please feel free to do so. John's also says that he's going to uh, uh, rejoin us in the new year with uh, some some additional presentations, which we would look very much forward to seeing. Again, if anybody else has uh, any kind of uh, presentations that they would like to do, uh, please uh, contact us. Um, at contact us at provalisresearch.com or support at provalisresearch.com or you can you can uh, contact me directly at what you sh most of you probably have my email from eventbrite at tony.ross at provalisresearch.com um john do you have any uh, last words before we uh, uh, no, I just uh, kind of echo what you said uh, people should feel free to reach out to me my own research interests are very much tied to decision making the psychology of decision making the idea of uh, dealing with advertising, with uh, uh, propaganda, things of those nature, the ability, uh, that's my next project, and that is, can I come up with propaganda or advertising or, you know, kind of keyword identification of things that are kind of uh, have agendas attached to them and so on. It's all tied to decision making and uh, uh, psychology. Um, and economics, I would say. So that's that's my research interest. So if anybody is has a similar interest, uh, please let me know, and uh, maybe we can come up with a uh, a webinar that would be a joint uh, kind of presentation. <laughs> that's that, that's a great idea. Thank you very much. Um, so that's uh, that's all that we have today. We will be starting more lunch and learns in in the new year. Probably won't be having any between now and the end of December with the holidays coming up and people in exams and all other kinds of things going on. But we uh, we will be starting them again in, in January. So please watch out for our social media and our newsletter, our Twitter feeds and other things, and also on our, on our website about when those uh, events um, will be coming up. So thank you very much everybody for listening. Oh, th and just one last thing, this event is being recorded and we'll be posting the recording uh, up on our uh, the webinar section of our website in the, uh, in the next couple of days. So thanks again, John, and have a great day, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.